Welcome back. As perhaps the most popular purveyors of progressive rock since Genesis, the British rock group Marillion have consistently topped the charts and packed venues throughout Europe. I was joined on Tuesday night by the band and its principal songwriter and lead singer, Steve Hogarth. I'm Isn't too you, shy. You, I can't you, do this interview. I'm sorry. You seem to be. I mean, you're big, big in Europe, and you've you've written this song, this new song called "Beautiful." You 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 know, you're talented, talented guy. So why Very do you much. feel so kind of twitchy about being introduced like that? Um, well, no, it's it's just it's just always amusing to be to be talked about and and uh, and you know in in one's own presence, mm -hmm. um, and and the whole progressive rock thing too. You know, is uh, is something that I suppose. You know, other people are more conscious of them than we are, and we don't really feel like we're any kind of band, or that we have to hit the market, uh, or that you there don't. is a marketplace. No, no, you no. don't. You don't move on. I mean, you don't think how are we going to target this new audience? I, I know you're playing uh, big in Eastern Europe. You don't think, for example, well, we've got this new audience, this potentially huge audience. Let's think of how we can play to them. Um, there's no harm in going and playing to them physically and, and, and doing shows there and, and getting in front of them and going, well, this is how we are. Uh, but I think it's there's something terribly, uh, I don't know, dishonest about um, manufacturing a product for a market. Uh, I don't think that's art. I don't think it's creative. I think it's a factory process. Um, and, uh, you know, most people dr who work in factories dream of being... In, in rock and roll, so you wouldn't want to turn it into a factory having got there. But what about comparisons with other rock and roll bands? You, you, <laughs> you, work, you work in this, it's highly competitive. It's who's going to get the single, who's going to get the highest uh, rated album. It's, it's all that kind of stuff, getting the, getting the right guys out to promote you, all of that. That's pretty tough as well. So you, you, don't, you can't operate in a total vacuum, can you? Well, you can't, but um, to some extent, if you've got a live following, if you've got a lot of people who believe in you because of what you've, you've done all along, then you're buffeted by um, the next big single to some extent. Um, the pressure isn't on to have another hit. Uh, and that, that's to do with the targets you set yourself as well. Like I suppose when Sting gets up in the morning and he thinks, well, I've got to write another number one. Uh, uh, maybe he doesn't, maybe I'm doing him a disservice, but. Um, we don't really think like that at all. We just think, well, we'll go and we'll write something good. And, and mm. if it charts, that's terrific. And if it doesn't, well, never mind, you know, because there's a big enough fan base out there to, um, to, to pay the rent, you know, and, and for us to get by and make the next record. Um, and at the end, we, you know, we were talking about mortality, weren't we, just before we went on air. And one day we're, we're all going to be dead on a slab. So the wonderful thing about being in a band and uh, doing this professionally is you get to leave something behind and you're a fool if you if you leave something behind which isn't a part of you and is just an experiment to make money I, I personally think uh, you might as well leave something behind that you felt strongly about that had your own emotions and your own sensitivities wrapped up in it afraid of sunlight is basically that isn't it it's looking back at people's lives mm. there are icons throughout mm. uh, the, the album the people who've fallen Talking about John Lennon, O.J. Simpson, all these kind of guys. Who Elvis? Yeah. What was going on in, in your head when you decided you wanted to write about these people and, and write music that picked up the themes of a fallen icon? Two really important things happened during the Brave tour, which was the tour of the album before this one. Um, first of all, uh, we did a show in Munich at a, at a place called Terminal Eins, which is the old airport terminal in Munich. And when we arrived to play, someone told us that the last band to play there was Nirvana. Mm. And it, as it turned out, that had been their last show. Um, and uh, Kurt Cobain had, had subsequently gone to Rome, uh, and they'd taken an overdose, they'd cancelled the rest of the tour. So as I went on stage to, to play, I was very conscious of the fact I was the first person to walk centre stage to sing since, since he had. Now, I, he wasn't very important to me as an artist, really, Kurt Cobain, but, but nonetheless, I was very struck by the, the ghostliness of it. And secondly, um, later on in the tour, um, we had a day off in Paris, um, and it was a Sunday, and we were watching the Grand Prix, and it was the, um, it was the Emola uh, Grand Prix where Ed and Senna lost his life. And I think that just, the two things together just started me off thinking, well, what's, what's it all worth, you know, to be so famous if, if it kills you or if it makes you unhappy or, or if, if ultimately you take your own life? 
Or if you screw everything up, you know, O.J. Simpson was in court, Michael Jackson was <laughs> allegations were going around, but, you know, uh, Liz Taylor never really seems to be happy. Sorry, I mean, I might be wrong, Liz. Um, mm -hmm. But I, uh, that's what started it all off, and John Lennon getting shot, and, and uh, I happened to see a documentary about Elvis, and all these people seemed so unhappy and yet seemed so successful. They were at the top of the pyramid, and you got the feeling that they weren't they hadn't done themselves a huge favour by being there. Mm -hmm. So what's it all worth if you've no peace of mind? And, and so I was trying to analyse that too, selfishly for, for myself, because if... Um, the pitfalls are there, aren't they? For yes, rock it's, star. it's like staring at your own future. I don't want to end up dead, you know. I, I don't want to end up on the street with a bottle. Um, what about cocaine? What about heroin? What about drugs? What about all these things that have been the downfall of so many rock icons in the past? What about that as far as you personally are concerned? As far as I'm personally concerned, um, I don't actually take anything. You, you're expecting me to say that, aren't you? But, um, no, I'm not. Oh, right. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, no, I drink. I, I have the odd bottle of Bex, but um, mm. I, if you're a singer, first of all, You've got a certain discipline because if you stick stuff up your nose, your voice goes in about a fortnight and you haven't got a voice anymore, so that's, there's no point in doing that. I've never smoked anything in my life. Uh, my mum and dad used to smoke when I was a kid and I had a phobia about it, you know, about ashtrays and the whole thing. So it, it, there's never been a lot of point in me like getting into smoking uh, anything. Um, so, you know, I have the odd bottle of beer and get, I'm famously, uh, a famously low tolerance to to most stimulants. You know, if I have if I have a drink, I tend to, to get giggly and fall over after about two bo <laughs> bottles of beer. So um, it's not really for me. But having said that, you know, I, I don't personally feel that any of us have the right to point a finger at someone else and tell them what to do with their lives and tell them mm -hmm. what not to do with their lives. We can tell them what happened to us. If I'd had a heroin problem and if it had been hell for me and I'd come through that, I'd be happy to open my mouth and say to people, for God's sake, don't do this. Mm -hmm. But um, to just stand on a box and say that having had no experience of it, is, I find is just a little bit vacuous and a bit close to PR. You know? Well, what do you stand for? And what we're going to hear in a minute or two is, you know, marvellous music, great lyrics. Thank you very much. Steve Hogarth, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Selena. We're going to listen to Beautiful by Marillion. It's the hit single. But before we do that, I'd like to say a big thank you to all my guests tonight and to all of you who've written into us over the last few weeks with ideas for the show. Let me remind you once again that we're still keen to hear which guests you'd like to see, which issues you'd like discussed. Do drop us a line. You can fax us on 0044 if you live outside the UK, 171-430-4576. Or you can email us on selina at itn.co.uk. We're back again tomorrow night at half past seven Central European time. Enough of me. Here is Marillion with Beautiful.